<clears throat> Hello everyone, welcome back. <clears throat> this is uh, Prince Eugene's Decisive Cavalry Charge. Second battle of, you know, I mean we all know, you know, no reason for me to say it. Mox. <laughs> Video. The 1680s proved a fruitful period for the Habsburg war effort. The siege of Vienna was beaten back. The Hungarian capital Buda was captured, and many strategic fortresses were seized throughout Hungary. This rollback of Ottoman influence had rightly caused a wave of optimism in the Austrian capital. Eugene of Savoy, while only playing a minor role during these campaigns, commanded his regiment with distinction and was noticed by the Margrave Louis of Baden, who wrote of the young Eugene in his letter to Emperor Leopold. This young man will, with time, occupy the place of those whom the world regards as great leaders of armies. Wow! Impressed by Louis's letter, Emperor Leopold promoted Eugene to Major General. But in the East, the winter of 1686 was greeted with great concern. While the Ottomans had been the dominant power for centuries, now Grand Vizier Sari Suleiman Pasha understood the empire's perilous situation and tried opening peace negotiations with the Habsburgs. But the Holy Roman Emperor and his commanders wanted to capitalize on the momentary weakness of the Ottoman Empire. They would settle for nothing less than the complete reconquest of Hungary. This episode is brought to you by Brilliant, the best online tool to teach yourself science, technology, engineering, and math. I think there is a big difference between just learning <clears throat> okay. Not long after the capture of Buda came the first snow of 1686, and both the Habsburg and the Ottoman armies retreated to their winter quarters. But preparations for the upcoming campaign next spring had already begun. The Habsburgs used the lull in the fighting to recruit mercenaries and other combatants, as well as to drill the troops. For Leopold, this was no longer a regular war. It now became a crusade. In contrast, the Ottomans faced a severe financial crisis. To combat the lack of funds for the war effort, new taxes were imposed and the ruling family opened the coffers in Istanbul. This was enough to fund the troops on the front line, but in terms of recruitment, the Grand Vizier received only levied troops, many of whom were inexperienced and lacked military training. Never the losses sword. during 1686 had been so severe that for the first time in history, the Ottoman Empire attempted to open peace negotiations with their enemies, but to no avail. Come spring of 1687, the Habsburg advance had begun. The Duke of Lorraine marched towards Osijek in Croatia with between 30 and 40,000 troops. The Elector of Bavaria and Emperor Leopold's son-in-law, Max Emanuel, marshaled an army of some 20,000 along the river Tissa. The armies joined along the way, and in early August they laid siege to Osijek. Suleiman Pasha had remained in Belgrade during the winter. When he learned of the Imperial Army siege, he began a march along the Danube with his 60,000-strong Ottoman army. When he reached Osijek, he swiftly repulsed the Imperials and pursued them to the north. A few days later, the Imperial Army reached Nagaharshani, a town to the southwest of Mohac. It was here that the army of Suleiman the Magnificent... Mohac... Mohac... Mohatch. It's exactly what I said earlier. ...broke the Hungarian kingdom. 
the death of its king, the virtual decapitation of the nobility, and the subsequent subjugation of its territory, made the Battle of Mohach in 1526 a powerful symbol in the collective memory of both the Hungarians and the Ottomans. Now, 161 years later, this symbolism was not lost on the two warring sides. The Duke and Elector understood the decisive battle was imminent. The rugged terrain around Nagaharshani hindered the Duke's army. He ordered his right and center flanks to move to Seaclos over a narrow, long road. A dense forest separated Seaclos and Nagaharshani, and the Imperial army had a tough time traversing the road. The Bavarians remained stationary around Nagaharshani to protect this maneuver. Likely unbeknownst to them, the Duke was moving away from the Ottoman camp, because to the south, Sari Suleiman Pasha knew his enemy was closing in. His troops constructed defenses as scouts closely watched the Imperial movements. When reports told him that the Imperial army broke up to reposition itself, he decided to act fast. Maximilian's Bavarian wing was an excellent target. Historians estimate the distance between the Bavarians and the Duke's army was nearly five kilometers. When the Grand Vizier realized the Bavarians were stationary and separated, and that the gap between the Imperial troops widened, he ordered the attack. His right flank, mainly consisting of cavalry, swerved to the right. His left flank, mainly infantry, launched a charge against the Bavarian infantry. Meanwhile, the center continued the construction of the defenses. Far in advance, 5,000 Sipahis rode to outflank the stationary Bavarians. Their fast advance alerted the Habsburgs of the impending attack. Maximilian frantically deployed his army in two lines and dispatched messengers to the Imperial Army traveling towards Seaclos. Eugene of Savoy was one of the first Imperial commanders to learn of the Ottoman attack. He immediately turned around with his small cavalry contingent and rushed to the aid of the Bavarian infantry. But oh. Okay. Wonder if the uh, that other group is going to turn around in time. We shall find out, shall we? Shall we? Shan't we? We will. But the real danger was to their left, the Sipahis. The war diary of a Bavarian major general mentions how Louis William, Margrave of Baden-Baden, rallied a considerable cavalry force with incredible speed and launched a counterattack to stop the Ottomans. They clashed to the Bavarian left. Fierce combat ensued without either side gaining a clear advantage. A similar battle emerged among the infantry. All the way to the west, news of the Ottoman attack reached the Duke of Lorraine. Despite requests for urgent assistance, Charles did not move. Valuable time was lost, as he reportedly did not believe that Maximilian faced the main Ottoman attack. It took a lot of convincing by lower commanders before the Duke decided to turn the army around. Meanwhile, the rapid deployment of the Bavarians and the grueling, indecisive battle unnerved the Grand Vizier. Suleiman Pasha was well aware that the lack of progress, despite having the element of surprise, was due to the relative inexperience of many raw recruits in the Ottoman ranks. Rather than risking the morale of his troops breaking under pressure, he ordered the cavalry and infantry to retreat and his cannons to open fire. An artillery duel erupted, with infantry and cavalry stationary facing each other. Maximilian urged Charles to launch a major counterattack. The Duke refused and started organizing another trek towards Seaclos. In frustration, 
Maximilian and Louis reported to Charles that they would mount a counterattack, even without his support. Lev um, quick question. Is uh, Charles V of Lorraine, is he commonly known as a douchebag? Just curious. Just curious how history thinks of him. Because right now, I don't like him. With no choice, the Duke of Lorraine relented and started arraying his men on the Imperial right. Okay, I like but him, he's alright. in the mean... I don't... Sorry, I... I don't hate him as much. Now he's actually trying to participate. Because he has a... Looks like a much larger army. So, he's not as bad. <clears throat> oh, that's what I did. I muted it. <laughs> ...and steal his men for another attack. The Ottomans repeated the same pattern. A concentrated attack against the Bavarian flank. This now, he doesn't know that, this, that Lorraine and his perm and all his men are over here, right? He doesn't know that. He just knows that they're what's in front of him. So he could be marching up to another attack and then... Right? Ahis were tasked with sweeping around them while the Janissary infantry advanced head on, supported by another contingent of Sipahis on their own left flank. Because the Duke was still stuck behind the dense woods, his flank could barely come to the Bavarian aid. Still, some of his troops slowly trickled towards the Bavarian lines as reinforcements. The Bavarian infantry countered the Janissary charge. Eugene led his cavalry into battle, taking a position among the vanguard. In the ensuing clash, the Janissaries were slowly pushed towards the constructed Ottoman barricades. Eugene's cavalry pursued them until they were in shooting distance. Some sources mention the cavalry pausing briefly until the entire Bavarian infantry caught up. As soon as the cavalry and infantry combined, Maximilian ordered the general attack. Meanwhile, the dense woods shielding the Ottoman left flank continued holding back the Duke and a part of his army. When it became clear that traversing the woods was impossible, Charles tried to circumvent them. Unfortunately, this maneuver took hours, and his part of the army would not reach the battlefield in time. Elsewhere, savage fighting to yeah, I don't like him again. ...took place on the barricades. As the infantry battle went on, Louis' cavalry pushed back the Sipahis. Then, the Margrave of Baden-Baden swerved to the Ottoman right, charging into their flank. Simultaneously on the other end, Eugene, leading his men from the front, broke through the enemy line with his cavalry contingent. Suddenly, the Janissary infantry was at risk of getting trapped in a pincer movement. Master new skills. Yeah, I, I really don't like that... that Duke. Just... If you don't want to fight, then don't fight. Don't show up. During this time, the Bavarian infantry continued the push. As the battle raged, cracks emerged in the Ottoman infantry formations. Some held firm, fighting to the death. But most, unable to hold the enemy back, broke and fled. The marshy terrain and ample rivers prevented the Grand Vizier from conducting an orderly retreat. Many fell victim to the marshy terrain and the Drava River. As night fell, it appeared the Imperial Army had won, against all odds. Contemporary sources mention the casualty numbers, but they should be viewed with a dose of skepticism. Namely, they mention that the Imperial Army suffered under 3,000 dead or wounded. In contrast, the heavy Ottoman casualties were owed to the Drava River, where many drowned or were killed during the pursuit. Up to 8,000 were killed or wounded, and 2,000 were captured. 
The Imperial forces seized 78 artillery pieces, 56 flags, and 5,000 muskets. The defeat at the Battle of Mohach sent shockwaves throughout the Ottoman Empire. Worse, it highlighted the instability of the state. After a botched counterattack, the Grand Vizier's army mutinied in Petrovaradin. He fled to Istanbul, and the angry troops followed. Soon after, a widespread mutiny broke out throughout the empire, culminating in the Grand Vizier's execution and the deposition of Sultan Mehmed IV. The mutiny lasted until April 1688. Consequently, the Habsburg leadership capitalized on the turmoil within the Ottoman state. The imperial troops advanced in a lightning campaign, conquering vital cities and strongholds, including Osijek, Petrovaradin, and Eger. In December, the Hungarian Diet elected the Habsburgs as hereditary kings of Hungary. As for Eugene, in recognition of his exceptional leadership in the battle, the Duke of Lorraine gave him the honor of personally informing Emperor Leopold of the victory at Mohach. In turn, the Emperor promoted Eugene to Lieutenant General. Word of his daring exploits traveled far, and King Charles of Spain admitted Eugene to the Order of the Golden Fleece. His star was on the rise, but he would soon face his greatest challenge yet. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. That's pretty good. Man, I don't like that Duke. And he gave him permission to go back to Leopold. I hope he didn't go back to Leopold with, yes, I have, you know, won this great victory. Dude, you weren't even there. I mean, okay, you were there. About as much as, like, um, someone wins the lottery at this gas station. And then I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I was four blocks away from that gas station when that guy won it. Pfft, can't believe that. That's that's about what he, he was miles away. I really don't like that guy. <laughs> oh well. I got some fuzz. I got some fuzz. Okay, I'm gonna end this here. You can put your pants back on if you took them off at the end of the last video that we did. You can put them back on now like and subscribe and have a good day have a good night